So it is a pleasure to have uh, uh, Professor Mirjana Povich. I hope I'm saying it right. <laughs> and from the look, I know I didn't. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, yeah, so it's really a pleasure. I, uh, I, I have to say that. Thank you very much for, 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 for joining us. So I won't say very much. I will let you introduce yourself uh, to, to, to uh, our uh, uh, students and, and alumni, and then we take it from there. OK, good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ketevi. Um, and um, uh, I'm, I have to say that I'm really happy to be here with uh, all of you. Um, and uh, I would like to uh, give my thanks uh, uh, to, to you, Katevi, and uh, all organizers of this uh, series of lectures. I think it's really good for our students. Um, and at least in this way, we can uh, beat, uh, establish the very first uh, contact uh, since unfortunately the school didn't uh, happen this year. No, but yeah, hopefully next year we will be able to, to do it. Um, so, uh, my field of research uh, is uh, in uh, extragalactic astronomy, so uh, I'm currently, um, uh, so I'm an astrophysicist, uh, originally from Serbia, uh, and um, uh, I did my PhD in uh, Spain at Canary Islands at the Institute of Astrophysics uh, of uh, Canarias. Uh, and uh, after Spain, uh, I worked for about one year in South Africa, then I moved again to Spain for about seven years, and then the last four years I've been working in Ethiopia as an assistant professor at the Ethiopian Space Science and Technology Institute, um, uh, mainly focusing in research on, uh, as I said, extragalactic astronomy field uh, broadly, but in particular on um, um, a study of the physics behind uh, active galaxies and nuclear activity in galaxies, um, and uh, also uh, dealing a lot with the morphological classification of galaxies, uh, morphological properties of galaxies, star formation, and also properties of galaxies in galaxy clusters. Uh, beside that, uh, um, I have to say that uh, also Africa is really my, uh, my big passion beside astronomy and um, uh, I've been uh, collaborating with different uh, uh, countries over the past 10 years and uh, um, uh, really one of my um, um, inspirations and I would say motivations is uh, that jointly we can uh, really work on development of education and uh, science in uh, Africa so that hopefully in the future we can uh, uh, decrease the huge differences that we are still facing between the northern part of the hemisphere and southern part and in particular um, uh, to improve different challenges that we, we have across uh, Africa. Uh, so uh, I think uh, next week uh, Eli will uh, focus his talk on active galaxies. So in, um, in collaboration with him I decided to uh, focus uh, today's talk and uh, tomorrow's talk uh, on a bit uh, giving you the introduction to actually extragalactic astronomy and uh, uh, in particular um, uh, focusing on uh, uh, the diverse world that we have uh, uh, regarding uh, galaxies. Uh, so yeah I didn't mention that also beside working at um, in Ethiopia currently, I'm also uh, attached still uh, as a uh, associate researcher at the Institute of Astrophysics of Andalusia in Spain. And thanks to that, uh, we really established uh, strong collaborations between Ethiopia and, uh, and Spain through different uh, projects. Um, so this is a bit uh, the uh, content uh, of the, the two lectures. Uh, so as I said, uh, it's a bit uh, the very introductory course of extragalactic astronomy. So today, uh, in the first part, we will a bit go through the concept of the galaxies and the concept of what deep surveys are and multi-wavelength data, and how both uh, deep surveys, multi-wavelength data really uh, contributed to important development uh, in our knowledge uh, about uh, galaxies and in all the field of extragalactic astronomy. Then we will go a bit through the types of the galaxies, and we will see that there are different actually uh, classification um, uh, schemes that we can uh, use. 
And then, uh, in more particular, we will focus on the properties of different morphological types, going through the properties of elliptical, spiral, uh, irregular galaxies, and so on. Um, and we will see also why morphological classification of galaxies is important and uh, also how we can classify galaxies uh, both in a more nearby universe and more distant universe. And uh, finally, if we are still left with, with time, uh, we will uh, briefly go through the main relations or scaling relations that uh, uh, we have in the world of galaxies. And if we don't, uh, I hope that we will at least be able to start uh, uh, that part and then uh, continue maybe tomorrow. And then tomorrow uh, we will um, uh, go through the galaxy mergers interactions, uh, the properties of uh, uh, galaxies that have strong star formation going on, uh, briefly about uh, active galaxies and AGN, because as I said, although it's my field of research, I think Ellie will speak more about it. Uh, and then uh, also we will uh, see a bit uh, um, the properties of galaxies in galaxy groups and clusters and briefly uh, the principal models that we have about galaxy formation and uh, evolution. So, um, uh, Katevi, is it, uh, shall I go through the lecture uh, or people can ask questions and interrupt me in the, in the middle? What do you suggest? I think uh, which one do you here. prefer? Normally, yeah, they can, if there are questions on the chat, I can, I can relay them to you or the people who wants to, who raise their hands, they can ask you questions uh, along the way. Okay, I, I don't think, uh, while I'm uh, speaking, I don't think I will be able to follow the, uh, the uh, I will chat. follow the chat. I will uh, follow. So, then either you can either people can just interrupt or maybe we can uh, maybe it's easier to just leave it for the end okay fine yeah that okay. sounds good okay so just uh, uh, take the take the notes along the the lecture sure okay so the the very first uh, uh, i discussed with katevi a bit uh, what is the the level of uh, participants uh, and I uh, got the information that the level is uh, quite uh, diverse. Uh, so people are in general from physics background, but not necessarily from astronomy. Um, so uh, the, the first uh, slides are actually quite uh, basic. It's just uh, uh, to put us uh, in the place where we really are when we speak about uh, extragalactic astronomy. So we have actually different components in the universe and the uh, scale so we will just remind ourselves a bit uh, about that and then also the fields of the, uh, the study that we have in astrophysics. So this is a bit a simplified uh, image uh, where we can go from the uh, components that are, let's say, at uh, uh, smaller scales uh, from us uh, and uh, the part of the universe that is more known to us, uh, starting from uh, our uh, Earth and uh, solar system, uh, and then going uh, further and further. So, um, uh, you know that beside uh, the solar system, we nowadays uh, have uh, uh, many other planetary systems that have been uh, uh, detected uh, uh, and, uh, and found, uh, and uh, uh, those planets uh, out of our solar system, we call extrasolar planets. So it's really a very uh, hot topic uh, currently in uh, astrophysics, especially the question of uh, the search for the life. So it's a bit uh, the field of uh, planetary sciences that are dealing with all the properties of the planets, uh, small bodies, satellites, and so on. Um, and then uh, um, uh, sun is another uh, source that is uh, really fundamental for us, as you know. And we have solar physics that is uh, focused on studying the properties of the sun, how the sun generates uh, energy, how the sun has been formed, how it will evolve, what will be the fate of the sun, and so on and so on. But then when we go out of the solar system, we enter in the world of the stars in general, where we have a stellar astronomy studying how the stars uh, uh, born, how do they evolve, uh, uh, what are different properties of the stars, what kind of stellar sources do we have, and so on. Then you know that uh, uh, our sun with other stars, with actually uh, 200 to 400 uh, billions of other stars, uh, uh, belong to the bigger system that we call uh, Milky Way, which is our galaxy. 
And uh, uh, we have in astronomy, uh, galactic astronomy that is actually focused on the study of the properties of the Milky Way, studying how the structure, structure of the Milky Way is, uh, the kinematic, dynamic, uh, what will be the future of the Milky Way and so on. But then when we go out of the Milky Way, we have billions of other galaxies and that's where the field of extragalactic astronomy uh, comes where we are uh, studying the properties of galaxies in general, uh, both at closer distances and further distances um, as well. We want to understand how the galaxies have been formed, how they have been, uh, uh, how they evolved across the cosmic uh, time. And uh, we observe really very, very diverse uh, world of galaxies that um, uh, hopefully you will see along uh, this lecture and then uh, uh, today, uh, tomorrow as well. And then uh, uh, we also have uh, finally the cosmology as, uh, as another big uh, field of, uh, of astrophysics uh, that is uh, studying uh, the properties of the universe in general and the model of the universe and also how the universe has been formed and uh, evolved. So uh, this is basically part uh, uh, that uh, combines uh, all the world of galaxies, but also including uh, the group group of galaxies, uh, large scale structure is uh, the part that is entering in, in extragalactic uh, astronomy. Uh, so um, just a basic definition of the galaxy for those of you that uh, are not uh, uh, used to, to astronomy or didn't have any astronomy course until now. So when we uh, speak about uh, galaxies, we refer to massive objects that are gravitationally bounded uh, and that uh, consist uh, of uh, uh, stars, uh, stellar remnants, and then uh, interstellar medium, uh, so gas and dust that is filling the space between, uh, between the stellar sources and stellar remnants, but also the dark matter. So um, these uh, galaxies, the galaxies in general, we will see that um, uh, basically, uh, uh, we uh, observed the revolution in our knowledge uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years, although the concept of the galaxy comes from much uh, earlier. So basically, in uh, 18th century, it was, uh, uh, let's say, for the very first time uh, when uh, some of the scientists, like Kant, uh, start uh, theorizing uh, that um, uh, maybe there could be uh, other sources, uh, uh, he called them nebula at that time, uh, that uh, could be independent galaxies or even uh, independent uh, universes. You know? So although at that time uh, it was uh, just a theory, in uh, 18th century as well, uh, Messier catalog was uh, there, so Messier observed uh, the celestial sources that are nearby to us and then he also observed uh, different galaxies including Andromeda galaxy at that time he didn't know that these are the sources out of our Milky Way uh, but it was one of important points um, uh, because it was one of the very first, uh, let's say, more complete uh, catalogs of uh, uh, the sources uh, uh, with observed sources uh, uh, nearby uh, us. In 19th century, uh, another step was uh, made by uh, William Parson, um, who for the very first uh, time uh, defined uh, uh, the um, um, the nebulas uh, that actually were galaxies, uh, but uh, uh, as I said, uh, he also didn't know at that time that these sources are out of our uh, own galaxy, but he separated them into taking into account their shape into more elliptical and more spiral uh, nebulas. And actually it was only in the uh, 20th century, at the beginning of 20th century, when for the very first uh, time, uh, it's been uh, 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 detected, it's been found that there are other galaxies out of our own. So basically many of those sources that have been previously observed, it's been seen that they are separate sources, that there are other galaxies and not sources uh, or nebulas within our own uh, Milky Way. So Hubble in that aspect uh, made a, a huge uh, contribution to astronomy by studying the variable stars, uh, cephates, uh, and then the, the relation between the period of these uh, stars and, uh, and then the, um, 
uh, the, the distance uh, as well. And we, could, we can say that that was actually the beginning of extragalactic astronomy when we uh, were able for the very first time to detect uh, uh, other galaxies uh, or let's say sources out of our uh, Milky Way. Uh, and actually, uh, besides that, uh, when we, for the very first uh, uh, time, were able to make a huge step in um, a discovery of the world of the galaxies uh, was with uh, um, uh, launching of uh, Hubble. So here is uh, one example of the Hubble Deep uh, uh, Field. And uh, in, uh, uh, when the astronomers, for the very first uh, time, pointed the telescope in the very small uh, area, on the sky close to the uh, Ursa uh, major constellation. And they pointed the telescope where it was uh, told that uh, it is empty of uh, sources. And uh, astronomers observed uh, during uh, 10 days with more than 340 exposures. And uh, uh, what was obtained uh, was this picture that you can see here uh, on this uh, slide, where people saw that um, uh, uh, that initially uh, empty part of the sky was actually full of galaxies. Uh, there were thousands of galaxies that have been found. And they found, they saw that actually uh, the galaxies uh, uh, can be very, very diverse in terms of their color. As you can see here, some are more bluish, others are, are more uh, reddish in terms of their uh, structure or shape, in terms of their size, uh, distances, and so on. So this was really one of, uh, uh, we could say, uh, uh, beginnings of uh, uh, the era of what we call deep uh, surveys. And then uh, the um, uh, explosion in the knowledge of extragalactic uh, astronomy. So with the deep surveys, uh, we mean exactly uh, how the uh, Hubble deep field was observed. So observing uh, during a long uh, exposure time, uh, smaller parts of the, of the sky so that you can go basically deeper in the universe and detect uh, fainter and fainter uh, sources. So this is another example of uh, deep uh, surveys uh, in a near infrared with the UKIDS, uh, UKIDS Ultra Deep uh, Survey, where you can see the bigger part of the sky and then the smaller part of the sky where, again, you can observe uh, thousands of uh, galaxies. Or like uh, here, this is one of the uh, deepest uh, um, uh, surveys that we have. Uh, it's a Kendall's survey that uh, mapped uh, uh, Cosmos field and then Goods uh, North and South field in a near infrared again. And you can see uh, on the, uh, in the picture on the right, uh, thanks to uh, the deep survey of candles, where the arrow is, uh, is a very, very distant uh, source. So it's a faint uh, and distance, uh, distant uh, quasar. And although in this picture, this source looks uh, just as a point source, and it looks that it's uh, less bright than, for example, the spiral galaxy that you have here in the in the uh, left uh, top uh, 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 side of the picture. This uh, source is much, much brighter than uh, this uh, spiral galaxy. And actually, it's very far away from us. It's at redshift uh, uh, 6. Redshift is a, uh, is a term for, uh, it's a, it's a, a property of, uh, that we are uh, using in, uh, in um, astronomy and in physics for measuring the properties of uh, the distance to the galaxies. Uh, and um, uh, uh, basically, this uh, uh, very distant source was uh, uh, formed when the universe was very young and only when it was about 5% of its uh, current uh, uh, age. Um, so, um, um, just to remind us that astronomy is uh, uh, observational science. Uh, of course, we have uh, theoretical astronomy as well. We have a numerical part now of astronomy and computational astronomy that is very important uh, as well. But uh, at the end, uh, we really need observations uh, in order to, to uh, confirm our theories. Uh, and basically, our main source of information in astronomy is the light uh, in more optical visible uh, range, but uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation in, in general. So basically, uh, all the, the universe that we are studying and what is happening uh, currently, what happened in the past, what will happen in the future, uh, we use by studying the electromagnetic uh, radiation. So we cannot 
Uh, here I put the note, we cannot per perform uh, in astronomy the experiment directly because we are dealing with very huge distances and we also have problems with time because since the sources are very far away from us and you know that the light since the light is our main uh, source of information and you know that the light is uh, uh, traveling with uh, limited uh, speed so it needs time to reach us so that means that when we are observing very far uh, galaxies very distant galaxies we are actually observing how the universe was in past so we observe uh, uh, how uh, if we have, for example, a galaxy that is at redshift uh, 2, which uh, 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 that we detect at redshift 2, we are observing how the properties of these galaxies uh, were when the universe was about half of its age. How the properties of that, that galaxies are now, we will observe in uh, uh, another 10, uh, uh, sorry, another uh, 7 billion years from now. So, um, uh, Having this uh, uh, in mind, uh, um, um, it doesn't uh, really make easy our um, uh, study of celestial sources, but we managed over the past uh, decades to really uh, improve uh, our um, uh, observational data and our instrumentation, which really contributed to huge uh, technological development uh, uh, in the field, uh, not only of astronomy, of space science in general, and then all the applications that we have currently. So uh, here I mentioned the two main uh, um, uh, observational uh, data that we have and that we used uh, in order to study uh, celestial sources in general, but also galaxies in particular. And one is the spectroscopy, another is photometry. So basically when we are dealing with, in both uh, cases, we are dealing once again with light or electromagnetic uh, uh, radiation. Uh, in case of spectroscopy, what we uh, want to do is uh, collect the light, but then see how this light uh, uh, um, uh, um, is, uh, um, uh, how the behavior of this light is at different wavelengths. So we want to see basically, as you can uh, see here, the, the uh, type of uh, just the example of one spectra. So how the flux or the luminosity of one source is changing with wavelength when you are going from smaller to, to larger wavelengths. And then in case of the photometry, the final product will be images. So basically in case of photometry, what we are doing is to collect the total light of the source and uh, uh, we will see that uh, uh, we will use different filters in order to, to get uh, uh, the images. So both kinds of data can bring us different information uh, uh, from celestial sources and galaxies, and we will see that uh, now. So in case of spectroscopy, just very briefly, we use the spectrographs uh, as instruments. Uh, we have different types of spectrographs, long slit, uh, uh, um, uh, high resolution spectrographs, uh, um, uh, tunable filters that is more between photometry, spectroscopy, and so on, uh, multi, uh, multi um, uh, object spectrographs, and so on. Um, but um, uh, so uh, this is just an example uh, when we have uh, one source that is giving us the light and then in case of the spectrograph the light will go through the slit uh, then come to the collimator where the rays uh, will become parallel and then in every spectrograph we need a certain uh, dispersive element in order to disperse the light so that we can really see how the intensity is changing with the uh, wavelength. So normally nowadays the spectrographs you, we are using the uh, diffraction gratings and finally, after passing through the grating, uh, the, we will uh, use the certain uh, detector, which currently uh, are mainly CCD uh, cameras and finally obtain the spectra. So uh, once we obtain the spectra, uh, we can uh, actually use the spectra for really uh, uh, measuring different properties of galaxies. This is just an example here where you have spectra of, of uh, four galaxies. Uh, and you can see that one of the first uh, things that we can do is galaxy classification using spectroscopy. So basically, uh, uh, you can see that there are different uh, uh, features that we observe in uh, one spectra, in another spectra. So once again, we can classify galaxies into normal, active, uh, uh, emission line galaxies, absorption line galaxies, and so on. 
uh, using spectroscopy, we can measure uh, the chemical composition and metallicity or the uh, percentage of uh, heavier elements in galaxies. We can obtain the distances. So uh, using these emission lines that you can see here, we can measure what I mentioned previously, the redshift, and measure how far away from us the galaxies are. And this became one of the main uh, methods in extragalactic astronomy to measure the distances to the galaxies. We can also measure the stellar mass. We can measure the e extinction or the amount of uh, dust in the galaxies, what kind of uh, stars the galaxy have, if, uh, if it has, if it's uh, older or younger, and so on. Then in the case of uh, photometry, instead of uh, a spectrograph, uh, so we are so we have the, the uh, normally nowadays uh, reflectors are the type of, types of the telescopes that, uh, that we are using. And then for the instrument, uh, after the light going through the reflector, uh, we will um, uh, use different uh, photometric bands or filters, uh, which means that uh, we are uh, passing only the certain amount of um, uh, light that corresponds to the certain uh, wavelengths. And after that, uh, we will again use the CCD cameras to obtain the uh, uh, images. So um, this is just an example of different uh, photometric systems or filters that we can use. This is in Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the five filters, basic filters that we have. It's one of the uh, most common, uh, most uh, um, famous surveys that we have in uh, astronomy, at least uh, uh, in the um, uh, nearby uh, or low uh, redshift universe. And you can see that uh, uh, the, this is the same part of the sky uh, observed in different filters. So you can see that we are actually using different filters, getting different information of the galaxies. So we are basically uh, observing a different stellar uh, component uh, when we are going from U uh, filters that is more in a blue part of the spectrum to the Z uh, filter that is more in the red part of the spectrum. Or, for example, in a Lambda uh, survey where uh, instead of uh, five, like in Sloan, we have uh, 23 uh, more narrow bands. And again, you can see as you are compared, going from one filter from blue uh, part uh, of the spectrum up to the near infrared, how the stellar component uh, is uh, changing for two different uh, kinds, the um, spiral galaxies in, uh, on the left and elliptical galaxy on the right. So basically, uh, once we obtain the, the images in photometry, we can again use these images for object classification, especially for the morphology. In order to get the most precise information about morphology, we really need photometric data. From spectroscopy, we can get intuition about morphology as well, but uh, uh, photometric data are really fundamental ones, uh, a fundamental one for, uh, for understanding how the shape of the galaxy and the structure of the galaxy is. We can also deal with the size, something that we cannot really obtain from uh, our spectra. We can also measure distances. We can use uh, photometric information, especially if we have many bands like in a Lambda survey to measure photometric redshift and then also the stellar mass. And the most important, we use photometry for measuring the brightness of the sources. So different brightness properties, uh, parameters like, uh, like uh, magnitudes, flux, luminosity, uh, or colors. Uh, so this is uh, just, again, to remind us that uh, um, um, the previous two that I mentioned, spectroscopy photometry, uh, although in this uh, lecture, we will more focus on optical part. Uh, but uh, we shall not uh, uh, forget that uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation is uh, something that uh, uh, is very, very uh, broad. Uh, and that uh, when we are dealing with uh, information coming from galaxies, we are basically uh, dealing with properties uh, uh, going from uh, gamma rays up to radio. And this is just a brief reminder for you that uh, uh, all properties of the uh, electromagnetic radiation will change as you're going from gamma rays from radio in terms of the temperature going from, as you can see here, billions of or tens of billions of Kelvin up to only few Kelvins in terms of the wavelength and then uh, uh, in terms also of the uh, frequency and, uh, and energy which means that uh, we are basically also dealing with very different properties, uh, physical reactions, and uh, different uh, uh, state of the matter. 
So in gamma rays, X-rays, we basically are dealing with fully ionized uh, matter. And then uh, uh, when you go to the radio and uh, as you're going through the uh, visible up to the infrared and radio, uh, we are able to obtain the matter more in uh, even uh, atomic or molecular uh, state. So uh, using uh, different part of uh, studying different parts of electromagnetic uh, radiation coming from, uh, from galaxies and all celestial sources, we then develop different parts of uh, uh, astronomy. So going from radio astronomy up to the gamma ray astronomy. And each of these is actually uh, uh, important for really understanding fully the properties of galaxies. This is just another uh, reminder that basically uh, due to the, uh, our atmosphere, we have the problem of the transmittance and uh, from the ground, we can only observe in optical and radio, as you know, and then uh, that will affect uh, the uh, development of our instruments in astronomy. So we will have uh, uh, observatories on the ground only in optical and then in radio, uh, also in gamma rays, but uh, not detecting directly gamma rays, but more Cherenkov, uh, Cherenkov radiation. But then in other parts of electromagnetic radiation, like in gamma rays, X-rays, uh, uh, most of the ultraviolet and then infrared uh, uh, plus uh, microwaves, we really need to send our uh, instruments uh, to the space. So here, uh, why uh, observing galaxies uh, at different wavelengths uh, is uh, important? Uh, we will try to see through a few examples. Uh, this is example of one spiral galaxy. And if I uh, ask you, uh, what, do you uh, what do you think if uh, the source here on the top um, uh, uh, left uh, uh, is the same one as the top uh, at the bottom right? Uh, uh, you will probably say if you don't really um, uh, have any information, just looking, uh, just using uh, visually uh, the image, we will say that these are two different sources. However, uh, this is the same source that you can see here, but observed at different parts of electromagnetic um, uh, spectrum from X-rays up to the radio. And we can see that actually uh, for the same spiral galaxy that we see it as a spiral, when we go to the visible range, um, either using uh, more uh, ultraviolet uh, um, uh, bands or, or more infrared bands, uh, in X-rays, we basically don't get any information about the spiral structure of the galaxy, but what we do see is very, very strong, uh, the central part of the galaxy where we have the supermassive black hole and we uh, uh, obtain a very, very strong radiation from the near areas, uh, near uh, regions of the supermassive uh, black hole. And then we also see very strong uh, uh, different uh, stellar sources that are uh, that have strong emission in x-rays such as supernovas or x-ray binaries uh, or uh, uh, or even gamma ray bursts uh, when you go to the ultraviolet we will see very strong emission coming from exactly the spiral arms because uh, in ultraviolet we will see the emission coming from the very young stars and massive stars that are emitting in ultraviolet and then as you are coming closer to the uh, going through the visible and coming to the near infrared uh, uh, part, we will see uh, different stellar components going from uh, younger stars again in bluer bands toward the older stars in uh, in uh, redder bands, and then when you come to the far infrared, we will see the emission actually coming from the very hot dust dust that is fulfilling the space between the galaxies and that is uh, emitting in uh, in um, uh, infrared. And finally, in radio, we will see the emission coming from the very, very cold uh, materials, such as uh, the, the molecular clouds. This is another example of another uh, spiral galaxy, the Whirlpool galaxy, that is a bit uh, reflecting the same uh, uh, picture and uh, uh, with a bit more of, uh, of uh, details. Uh, so basically, um, uh, from this, that is uh, a bit uh, normal galaxy, how we see it uh, through the uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, spectrum. Uh, uh, we can go to another example of one active galaxy where on the left, sorry, on the right, you can see three images observed in X-rays, radio and optical. And this is the, uh, these are the three images of the same source of the Centaurus A galaxy that is the nearby 
uh, the nearest active galaxy that we have to our Milky Way. And you can see that these three images on the right are very different. And again, we are from each image, we are getting very different information. From X-ray image, we will get again the information from the AGN, so from the very central part of, uh, of the galaxy, uh, and uh, the information coming from the hot corona around the accretion disk. Uh, from the radio, we will observe the very strong radio jet with all these radio lobes, something that we will not be able to see at all when you go to the optical. And in optical, we will be able to see the host galaxy of the, uh, the AGN or the active galactic nuclei with also all these um, uh, dust lanes. So basically, we can say that the uh, image of Centaurus A, the, the total, the composite image is the one that is uh, on, uh, on the left. And this is how our galaxy looks like. Um, uh, so if we look, uh, if we only observe in uh, optical or in X-ray or in radio, we will lose a very important part of the galaxy that then can affect uh, uh, the interpretation of different properties that we are observing about this galaxy. So uh, this, uh, uh, with all of this, I want to um, uh, show that uh, multi-wavelength observations in uh, astronomy, especially in extragalactic astronomy, are really fundamental and they really, really um, uh, uh, are the, um, the as I said, the fundamental ones in order to, to understand fully the physics behind uh, uh, different uh, celestial sources that we are observing. So basically, when we put together the deep surveys that I mentioned previously and then the multi-wavelength data, we can say that thanks to the two, we really managed to understand uh, uh, much better uh, the world of the galaxies over the past uh, uh, few decades. And both of them uh, uh, were really crucial for getting more uh, the information about the formation and evolution of uh, galaxies. So basically now I will go more through uh, what the uh, classification uh, of galaxies uh, um, uh, are. Uh, with how much time I'm left? Uh, um, <clears throat> let me see where, where we are right now. So yeah, with about... Uh, yeah, I, I Half think. An hour, no? yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think you have another uh, 20, 25 minutes. Okay. okay. Then we go into uh, the question so and answer part, but it depends on how many questions we have as well. So. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so I will I will try to uh, go through. So um, uh, when we come to the classification of galaxies, uh, actually uh, we are. Uh, coming to the very complex uh, field because uh, we can use different criteria uh, for uh, um, uh, classifying uh, galaxies in terms either of their properties or also on the type of the data that we are uh, using, uh, such as X-rays or radio or infrared data and so on. So the main classification, we will see it a bit uh, later, the main classification that we know is using morphology. So normally when we ask what kind of galaxy it is, we refer to morphology. So we refer to one of the uh, four main types, uh, either if the galaxy is elliptical, lenticular, spider, irregular, or maybe peculiar. But also beside uh, this, uh, we do have different other classifications using, for example, size, where we have all the range of uh, galaxies uh, from dwarf galaxies to giant galaxies, where, as you can see here, uh, the, the sizes of galaxies, galaxies can, be, uh, can be very, very different from only a few uh, uh, or tens of kiloparsecs up to even uh, one, two megaparsecs. Uh, then uh, we can also classify galaxies using uh, the nuclear activity or having the presence or absence of uh, active galactic nuclei that we will hear about, about it more tomorrow. And we can uh, classify galaxies into normal or inactive, non-AGN or non-active, and then active galaxies, or very often we just call them AGN. Then uh, we can also classify galaxies in terms of uh, how strong star formation is going on. So if we have just normal galaxies or we have more intense star formation, uh, such as in uh, starburst uh, galaxies. 
Then also mass is another parameter. So we do have uh, those galaxies that we call uh, massive or low mass uh, galaxies. Then in terms of the distance, so redshift, so we can divide galaxies into um, a low redshift into nearby galaxies or local galaxies, uh, low redshift galaxies, intermediate, high redshift galaxies, and so on. Then in terms of the infrared luminosities, uh, we have galaxies that are uh, uh, luminous in uh, infrared or normal, uh, where the uh, limit of uh, 10 to 11 uh, solar luminosities in far infrared is used as, as um, as a, as a limit, as I said, uh, but then we can also have uh, ultra luminous infrared galaxies, uh, hyper luminous or even um, uh, extreme luminous infrared uh, galaxies, and we will uh, go more into the details of these galaxies uh, tomorrow. Environment is another uh, important uh, property uh, or parameter, and uh, we, can, we will see tomorrow the galaxies can be in very different environments. Uh, going through the um, uh, interactions, mergers, but also they can be totally isolated, uh, they can be in pairs, they can be in groups, they can be in clusters, and so on. Then, in terms of colors, we also see galaxies that are more reddish or bluish, and we will see a bit uh, later, hopefully, that we have those galaxies that we have a red sequence, blue cloud galaxies, green valley galaxies, and then also we can use spectroscopic properties and then detect emission line galaxies or Lyman Bray galaxies or uh, absorption line galaxies and so on. So as you can see, there is really, really um, a very um, uh, large uh, range of, uh, of classifications and many of them uh, are also um, uh, connected. So basically, uh, I will now go through the uh, main uh, part of the classification of, of galaxies that is focused on the morphology. And one of the principal um, uh, classification diagrams that we are using is coming from uh, Hubble. And uh, uh, I will actually focus uh, uh, now the most of the uh, uh, what is left of the lecture on uh, the morphological uh, properties and types of galaxies. And we will see that uh, it is really fundamental for, uh, for astronomy. So this is a bit what we call the Hubble sequence. And uh, Hubble uh, basically at the beginning of uh, past century uh, separated all galaxies into four main uh, types uh, using simply their structure or their shape. So we have uh, galaxies uh, that are having more uh, spheroidal or ellipsoidal structure. And then those galaxies that we call ellipticals, and then those galaxies that, are ha that have more uh, what, we, uh, what we call a spiral uh, structure, that we call spiral galaxies. And then we have other two types. Uh, one are the intermediate galaxies uh, between elliptical and spirals that we call lenticular galaxies that are actually more similar to, to uh, in many properties, to elliptical than to spiral galaxies. And then we also have irregular galaxies that have very, very um, uh, irregular shapes. So um, in more broad classification, uh, we basically classify these four main types into two groups, those that we call early type galaxies and uh, those that we call late type galaxies. In the first one where we have elliptical and decular galaxies included, and then in the second one where we have spirals and irregulars. And why do we call them early type, late type? Uh, we will, and why morphology is so important? It's important because we really can connect morphology with many, many other uh, parameters. Um, uh, and uh, we, will, uh, we will see that uh, just in, uh, in, uh, now in, uh, in a moment. But when we call them, when we say early and late type galaxies, from this terminology, you can also conclude or intuit, uh, have the intuition that uh, morphology is also related with uh, age. So basically, early type galaxies are the oldest galaxies that we observe in the universe, while late type galaxies uh, are um, younger galaxies uh, that we have in, in universe in terms of, of their age. So this is just a brief summary about the main components that we observe in galaxies. So the principal components that we have that then we use for uh, describing the structure of the galaxy is the, the nucleus or the very central part of, uh, of the galaxy. 
uh, then the bulge that is again the very very central part of the galaxy with a very strong concentration of the stars and it's also the oldest part of the galaxy where we find the oldest stars and then we can have or not depending on the type of the galaxy the galactic uh, disk and then if we are having a disk inside the disk we can uh, observe different uh, structures or components like spiral arms and sometimes we can observe the nuclear bar as well in one part of uh, spiral galaxies and then also we have the galactic uh, uh, halo but beside this we can also have observe different other components not in all galaxies but in different uh, uh, in some of the galaxies, such as uh, different uh, filaments um, of uh, star formation, uh, the, the rings of star formation, the relativistic jets that we observe in radio, as I mentioned previously, and so on. So basically, uh, why we should care about morphology uh, uh, once again, because it is really one of the key elements in order to study the galaxy formation and evolution. And this is one of the main questions that we have in extragalactic astronomy. So one of the main questions is to really understand how the galaxies form and how the galaxies evolve. So the galaxies, as all uh, other celestial sources in the universe, are in a constant change. So at some point they will bo uh, be born, they will go through their life, going through different phases, and then finally they will, uh, they will die. So the question uh, really how galaxies form and evolve in order to understand, we really have to um, understand the morphological uh, properties. And we will see that uh, morphological properties are really connected with many other properties of uh, galaxies. This is just uh, one of the examples. I will go through this diagram a bit uh, later. So this is a diagram when we observe um, uh, the color in relation to the uh, stellar mass uh, of the galaxy. So the color, when we say color, we basically compare two different uh, 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 brightness parameters of the galaxy observed in two different photometric uh, filters. So more in blue part and then in red part of the, the spectrum. And then we will be able to see if the galaxies are more bluish or more reddish, which will tell us actually about what kind of stars the galaxies uh, have. If they are more bluish, they will have more younger stars. If they are more reddish, they will have in general more um, uh, older stars. But we will see a bit later that also it is not uh, so trivial. We can have other components uh, inside the galaxy that can also contribute to the color of, of, the, uh, of the final color, such as, for example, the distribution and the amount of dust or the absence uh, and presence of, of the, the AGN in the center of the galaxy. So basically to come back, the morphology is related with uh, uh, many other properties. So here we can uh, see that it's related with the color, then it's related also with the stellar mass, but also with the luminosity and absolute magnitude. So most of the uh, galaxies uh, uh, that are early types, so either elliptical or lenticular, uh, are having more reddish colors, and then most of the spiral galaxy will be more uh, blue. Not all, but uh, uh, the, the big majority. Then in terms of the stellar mass also, we see the differences. We know that the most, most uh, massive uh, galaxies are actually elliptical galaxies. And then also the brightest galaxies will be elliptical galaxies as well. But then also morphology uh, uh, relates with many other properties, such as the black hole mass, the nuclear activity, the environment, the X-ray properties, and so on and so on. So uh, now I will go uh, uh, through uh, some of the um, um, uh, basic types, uh, 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 the properties of uh, the main uh, four main morphological types that, uh, that I mentioned. Uh, so one are the, um, uh, uh, the first are elliptical galaxies. And um, uh, we will see that uh, um, uh, here you, have, you can see the different uh, types of elliptical galaxies uh, depending on uh, their ellipticity. We can uh, separate them between E0, uh, those that are more spherical in their shape, uh, up to the E7 that are more ellipsoidal. Uh, in general, as you can see here, uh, elliptical galaxies have um, uh, or show little structure. 
they have very, very strong uh, bulge, but they uh, basically don't have disc or have very poor uh, disc. But we don't observe the spiral arms nuclear bar as we will see in uh, spiral galaxies. So at the beginning, uh, um, uh, it was uh, thought that elliptical galaxies have very small uh, or basically don't have at all uh, the, the amounts of interstellar mediums, so gas and dust that, I, as I said, is fulfilling the space between the galaxies. But nowadays, especially using uh, radio data, uh, it's been seen uh, that uh, uh, we do have uh, uh, also gas and dust, but uh, in much uh, uh, lower amount, amount than in the case of uh, spiral uh, galaxies. Then normally, um, uh, in case of uh, elliptical galaxies, um, uh, uh, um, due to the models, we know that many of them are actually, if not all, are formed through the galaxy mergers and interactions. We will see that even more tomorrow. Then uh, these galaxies uh, uh, don't form uh, stars uh, very much, so they have very low uh, star formation uh, activity. Uh, and then um, um, uh, that uh, suggests that uh, most of them are, uh, as I said, more reddish and uh, have uh, older uh, stellar populations, uh, or that even they can have uh, higher metallicities. But not all of them. Uh, some of them can also have blur colors uh, in case they have recent star formation going on through the infall gas, for example, or uh, interactions with other galaxies or if they have the AGN in their center. Uh, then uh, in terms of the, um, I will have to speed up a little bit um, because of the time. Uh, in terms of the uh, size, uh, you can see here that the mass size uh, of elliptical galaxies uh, can have a very different, uh, very broad uh, range in terms of, of mass uh, from 10 to the 7 up to 10 to the 13 uh, solar masses. And then uh, they can have different sizes on this picture on the, on the uh, right. You can see the, in the center, the giant elliptical galaxy. And then on the bottom, uh, on the right, uh, the dwarf elliptical galaxy. And you can compare uh, how big uh, can be the difference in the sizes between the two elliptical galaxies, the, the dwarf ones and then the um, uh, uh, giant elliptical galaxies. Uh, those giant elliptical galaxies are very often uh, found in the center of the galaxy clusters. We will see more uh, uh, about that tomorrow. And uh, in that case, we very often call them the brightest cluster mem members because they are really the brightest uh, ones as well in the clusters. Uh, to describe galaxies, uh, very often uh, we study their brightness profiles. So we study how the brightness of the galaxy is changing as you're going from the center of the galaxy uh, to the edge of the galaxy. Uh, this is one of the forms, the CERSIC uh, profile that we can use. And it's been seen that uh, the elliptical galaxies, because they have a very strong uh, bulge, um, can uh, basically be fitted uh, very well with the Vaculier law, uh, which is uh, basically the CERSIC uh, uh, law with this index, CERSIC index uh, equal to four. In terms of the spectral properties, um, uh, this is uh, uh, on the bottom one of the typical spectra of uh, one elliptical galaxy, where you will see many, many of absorption lines coming from the stellar component, especially from the older stars, but basically none of uh, emission lines. And uh, the emission lines you will not see um, uh, often in elliptical uh, galaxies uh, if they don't have really the AGN in the, in the center or very recent uh, star formation for some of the, uh, the interactions that they are suffering. And then we can also say that the dynamics and kinematics of elliptical galaxies are very complex. So we can study dynamics and kinematics using uh, by studying the um, uh, surface profiles and then the, by fitting the galaxies using different isophotes. The isophotes basically, as you can see on this image uh, uh, on the bottom of the plot, isophotes are uh, the, um, uh, the structures that we are, we are using uh, where each, each isophote here has basically um, uh, the same um, uh, surface brightness. So uh, by studying the shape uh, and the position of uh, the isophotes, 
we can actually study the kinematic, uh, internal kinematics and dynamics uh, of, of galaxies. And we see that in case of elliptical galaxies, although they are very well uh, fitted with uh, uh, spherical or more ellipsoidal uh, isophotes, uh, very often these isophotes can be uh, twisted and uh, we observe the uh, triaxial uh, shape of, uh, of the galaxies, which means that internal, uh, again, the internal kinematics dynamics of the stellar component that we have uh, uh, is uh, much more complex than what uh, it looks like on our uh, images. Uh, when we go to the spiral galaxies, uh, to another uh, big, uh, broad uh, group, um, we can uh, do the classification in terms of two uh, basic, uh, two main uh, uh, things. One is the existence, uh, the presence or not of the, uh, the, the nuclear bar. So basically we have those galaxies that are spiral non-barred, where we just see the uh, spiral arms, but we don't see the nuclear bar in the middle. And those galaxies that are barred, that we that have the nuclear bar, so this structure that you can see that is coming from the central part, and that then at the end of the these uh, nuclear bars, the spiral arms uh, are coming. And then there is uh, uh, also the intermediate type that are uh, that is something between um, uh, uh, the nuclear bar galaxy, spiral galaxies that do have and don't have uh, the nuclear uh, bar. And then the other um, uh, uh, part that we are, the other property of spiral galaxies that we are using in order to separate, to classify them is uh, their size uh, of the, the size of the, the bulge. So how strong the bulge is in comparison with the disk. And then also how tight uh, the spiral arms are to the bulge. So basically taking all of this into account, we can separate galaxies into non-barred and barred, as I mentioned. But then we also have, as you can see here, all, all these letters that go from A up to D and uh, M. Uh, that are actually uh, focusing on the second point. So uh, in SA galaxies, we will have galaxies that are uh, having a stronger bulge um, uh, and then uh, more uh, uh, tight uh, spiral arms. And then as you're going from SA to the SD uh, galaxies, uh, we have the spiral arms that are more open and then also the disc that is more uh, dominant in comparison with the bulge in terms of the, the luminosity. So, um, what uh, are the other properties of spiral uh, galaxies? Uh, so basically in comparison now with elliptical, we uh, have the stellar populations that are much more diverse in uh, spiral galaxies. We have the bulge that is uh, more populated with older stars and then the disk that is uh, populated with uh, younger uh, stars. Um, uh, then we also have uh, very different star formation rates. So the, the um, formation of stars in spiral galaxies is much stronger uh, than what we've seen for elliptical uh, galaxies. Um, then um, uh, in terms of the um, uh, clusters, we have more stellar open clusters uh, now present in the disk of the spiral galaxies than what we have in elliptical galaxies where uh, globular clusters were more dominant. Uh, the spiral arms uh, actually um, uh, present basically the density waves. And these are the parts where we have most of the star formation uh, going on. Uh, then the nuclear bars uh, that we uh, observe in a certain part uh, fraction of the spiral galaxies um, uh, will uh, be again populated more with uh, older stars and then they will extend from the central part to the outskirts of the galaxy connecting after with the spiral arms. And uh, this uh, disk uh, structure is really important for studying the interstellar medium. So now in case of spiral galaxies, we have the interstellar medium that is a really important uh, component. And we can observe like uh, here, uh, like you can see here for the uh, Whirlpool spiral galaxy, uh, we now do observe um, uh, the presence of uh, either molecular gas or atomic gas or uh, ionized gas uh, as well in the galactic uh, uh, disk. And we also have a much larger amount of uh, dust 
uh, then in comparison with elliptical uh, galaxies. This dust is then uh, um, uh, also making more difficult our observations because it's responsible for absorbing the light coming from the stellar component and from the central part of the galaxy and also from the galaxy disk. Uh, so uh, it will affect uh, the measurement of many of the properties that we have to deal with when we are studying the, the galaxies. Then in terms of the brightness profiles, um, uh, we now have a bit more complex picture because we have more components. So normally in order to um, uh, um, study the brightness profiles, we have to separate the bulge from the disk and then fit using the, the CERSIC function again separately bulge with the, uh, the vacuolier low and then disk uh, separately using more exponential uh, low. And uh, uh, previously when we mentioned elliptical galaxies, uh, we basically didn't say anything uh, about um, uh, inclination. But when we study because elliptical galaxies, for elliptical galaxies, inclination doesn't matter because we have either, as I mentioned, spherical or ellipsoidal sources. But in case of um, uh, spiral galaxies that have disky structure, uh, inclination is very important parameter that can affect many of other parameters that we have to measure. So this is just an example when you have the galaxy uh, that is uh, face on where we can see the whole uh, disk uh, structure uh, where the inclination is basically zero and then the galaxies when it's totally uh, edge on uh, where you will be able to, to see basically uh, the bulge and then uh, the dust planes in the, in the disk but not uh, all the structure that we have in the, in the disk. In terms of the spectroscopic uh, or the, uh, the, the spectral properties, uh, beside the absorption lines uh, that uh, are uh, uh, less dominant or less strong uh, than in case of elliptical galaxies, we also have the emission lines that we can uh, observe due to the star formation going on. Uh, uh, and then uh, also spiral galaxies are very important uh, for, uh, so they are rotationally supported systems, so they are very important also for measuring the rotational curves of galaxies uh, and uh, obtaining the information about the, the dark uh, matter. Um, so I can say more about it uh, also during the questions. Uh, I will just try to, so I think one hour is uh, left. Um, can I maybe just finish, uh, go through a few more slides to finish with the um, morphological properties of galaxies and very briefly the, um, uh, the classification? I don't know how yes. many questions do we have. Um, yeah, we don't have a lot of questions. So maybe you can take another 15 minutes. Okay, 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 perfect. Okay, so then, uh, I will just briefly mention, so these are uh, uh, the main differences between elliptical and spiral galaxies. As you could see, they really uh, differ a lot in terms of basically all properties. No? So just a summary in terms of um, uh, color that we have more uh, reddish, that elliptical are more reddish uh, than spiral that are more uh, bluish in terms of the structure and the components that they have, in terms of the star formation that is uh, much uh, more active in the case of the spiral galaxies than elliptical galaxies uh, in terms of uh, their mass size and so on. Lenticular galaxies, uh, uh, if you remember from the beginning, they are also uh, involved uh, into uh, more classified uh, into uh, early type galaxies, but they really do have a bit uh, properties uh, between spirals and ellipticals. In terms, uh, terms of the, the, the shape, they more look like uh, elliptical galaxy, uh, galaxies because they don't have um, uh, so visible and clear the, the components like spirals, but uh, so they are also more like sp uh, spheroidal, ellips uh, more ellipsoidal, but they do have a bit of disky structure they can, uh, that we can uh, see. They do have more amount of interstellar mediums, so ga both gas and uh, dust. But they have more smooth uh, brightness profiles, more similar to the um, elliptical uh, galaxies. Uh, they mainly have uh, older stars, so again, very similar to elliptical uh, galaxies. And uh, 
uh, in terms of the spectroscopic properties, again, they are more dominant, they have more dominant absorption lines and not very uh, strong emission lines, except again, if they don't have a recent star formation going on or uh, AGN in their center. And then again, very briefly about irregular galaxies that are actually uh, some of the younger galaxies that we have. So the galaxies that are either just forming or that uh, they have been formed uh, uh, previously, but uh, due to the tidal interactions or um, uh, interactions with other galaxies, they have been, um, uh, their, their morphology has been uh, totally, uh, became uh, totally irregular. So, um, so the irregular galaxies, we call them irregular because they really don't have any particular uh, uh, shape. Uh, however, they do contain uh, very strong, uh, very large amounts of gas and dust of uh, interstellar medium. Uh, and then uh, normally they have a, um, a, a large amount of uh, uh, young stars. So they are uh, bluer in colors. And then they also have larger amount of open stellar clusters. In principle, we have uh, three main types of irregular, irregular galaxies. Uh, the type one uh, that do have certain structures, uh, like uh, for example, the large Magellanic cloud that you can see here, that is one of satellite galaxies of our Milky Way, or the type two galaxies that do not possess any structure, like in the, the first uh, picture on the top. And then we also have dwarf irregular galaxies that are much, much smaller in size and that normally are found as uh, satellite galaxies of, um, of uh, larger uh, normal galaxies. So, and then the very, very final and very briefly, we also have a, a, a bit extension of the Hubble sequence uh, onto the, what we call the peculiar galaxies. So uh, now that we have many more observations, we do see that many galaxies um, uh, are peculiar galaxies uh, so that they do have different, uh, although they have irregular shape, similar as uh, irregular galaxies, um, uh, they do have additional components. So uh, most of these galaxies are actually related with galaxy interactions and mergers. And what we actually see are uh, different phases that the galaxies are going through uh, during the interaction and, uh, and the merger. So we don't really have any particular classification of peculiar galaxies. There are some works as the one that I mentioned here. And here you can see all different types of peculiar galaxies. As I said, every time that we have uh, some particular structures that we cannot fit the galaxy into any of the previous uh, types, we will call them uh, peculiar galaxies. So just very, very briefly, how we can classify galaxies. Uh, so these are uh, three of the basic uh, methods. So either we can use, use the visual classification or methods that we call parametric or non-parametric. Visual is basically that we just use our images, photometric images, uh, uh, mainly color images if we have them, and then our, uh, our eye. And we can simply using, uh, focusing on the shape and the structure, separate them uh, from elliptical uh, up to the irregular spiral and peculiar galaxies, no? Um, however, uh, we can do this only for those galaxies that are very close to us. So basically one advantage is that if you see by eye that it's a spiral galaxy, then you are sure that it's a spiral galaxy or elliptical if, if, if you are dealing with elliptical galaxy. But the problem is that uh, uh, as the, the uh, quality of your images is decreasing or the signal, noise, noise, uh, signal to noise ratio that you are having in your data, you will have more and more difficulties to detect uh, um, uh, uh, the structure, to, to see the structure of the galaxy. So basically we can use visual classification only for the well-resolved galaxies. But then also the visual classification is time consuming because you have to do one by one. So you can imagine now uh, surveys where we have uh, thousands or millions of galaxies and we do have uh, surveys where we have millions of galaxies. And now if you have to classify one by one, uh, it will be basically uh, impossible. Uh, and then also it can be subjective, you know? So when you come to the galaxies, uh, to the images that have a low resolution, very often you are not really sure if the galaxy is uh, spiral or elliptical, and then you need more classifiers, not only one. 
So another, uh, another possibility is that we uh, use uh, certain empirical laws that don't have anything to do with physical properties. So basically the brightness profiles that I mentioned previously. And with these brightness profiles, we try to fit uh, so basically we're using the CERSIC uh, law, we try to uh, fit the galaxy uh, and from the brightness profile obtain uh, if the galaxy is more early type or more late type, basically measuring what the uh, value of the parameter n, uh, index n is. So we saw that for elliptical galaxy, we will have larger values of uh, CERSIC index, for spiral galaxies, so around four. For spiral galaxy, if we have a pure disk, it will be one. If we have the mixture between the bulge and the disk, it will be uh, between one and, uh, and four. So basically, by uh, doing this uh, with and using different codes that I mentioned here, we can um, uh, classify uh, we can obtain different uh, properties, uh, like uh, what is the ratio between the flux uh, or the brightness of the bulge and the total brightness, uh, the size of the bulge, the size of the disk, and so on. And then from that, we refer what kind of morphological type do we uh, have. So uh, the advantage is that we get basically the detailed uh, structure analysis, so we can uh, compare galaxies in a very detailed way. But on, on the other side, again, we need uh, uh, high resolution images and also it can be time consuming in order to model well the, the galaxies. And the third part is the non-parametric that is also, uh, that is based on one side on measuring different uh, parameters that basically are such as concentration indexes, uh, symmetry parameters, different moments of light and so on. I will not go more uh, into the details, but you can ask me um, uh, after. And uh, basically with these parameters, what we use in order to measure them are two things. Either how concentrated the light is uh, in the central part of the galaxy and how this concentration is changing along the, the galaxy as we go from the center to the outskirts. And then also, how is the shape of the galaxy? So how symmetric or asymmetric uh, the galaxy is. So basically, then depending on the range of the values that we obtain for different parameters, uh, we can classify galaxies between early types and uh, late type galaxies. Um, with these methods, um, so the, this method is uh, basically uh, used um, uh, in two cases. One is when we have the uh, deep surveys such as here, when basically each of the dots that you can see on these images, both in one of the filters and the color image, each of the dots uh, that you can see uh, is uh, uh, one of the, is, is a galaxy. However, we see those galaxy, we can see on this image thousands of galaxies, but the majority of them are just compact or point sources. So they are so far away and so faint that we cannot say only visually what kind of galaxy it is, if it's a spiral or elliptical or irregular and so on. So basically, we will need then to use uh, these non-parametric methods in order to um, uh, obtain uh, the probability of the galaxy to be more early type or uh, late uh, type. Then we can uh, uh, combine, I, I will uh, uh, finalize uh, soon. We will then, we can combine different parameters and it's been seen that uh, these, combining these different parameters, we can actually um, uh, classify galaxies. We can separate between those galaxies that are more early and those galaxies that are more, uh, um, uh, that are more early or later types. So basically, the problem here is that the diagrams uh, do change, uh, uh, take into account different data sets. And then also the data quality again is important. So this is uh, just one example uh, in one of the works that we did a few years ago where we did the simulations. So basically we took two, uh, three different uh, surveys, uh, Alhambra survey that is the most shallow. So basically where we are, we are mapping those galaxies that are more um, uh, bright, and Cosmos Survey, where we are going much deeper into the uh, uh, universe and mapping even uh, fainter galaxies. So 
we took uh, the sample of local galaxies, uh, those uh, a few thousands of local galaxies for which we visually know what their morphology is, and then we moved galaxies into the magnitude distribution and redshift distribution that corresponds to these three uh, surveys. And we, uh, each of these surveys has different resolution and different deepness. And what we observed is that, for um, uh, example, these uh, in red, I put uh, uh, three galaxies that are uh, spiral, that have spiral structure, but that um, uh, you can, uh, if you go to Alhambra, you can uh, uh, detect, uh, if now you simulate this galaxy and you de uh, degrade the, the brightness and you move to higher redshift, uh, if the galaxy is moved in Alhambra, uh, for example, from 0 0.04, what is uh, the redshift, the distance of this galaxy, so very, very nearby galaxy, if we move it uh, to 0 0.24, we will be still able uh, to see the um, spiral structure of the galaxy, but going a bit uh, further, like uh, doubling the redshift, we will basically see this spiral galaxy as elliptical, just because uh, we lose uh, the, the part of the information uh, from the disk, from the, the fainter structures, and basically we will just see the galaxy, we will classify our galaxy as elliptical. However, if we go to Cosmos, the survey that is much deeper, uh, uh, even going to the um, uh, higher redshift, we are still able to detect the spiral galaxy as a spiral. So basically in this work, what we've seen that the spatial resolution of the data and then the depth, the data depth are both important. However, the, the spatial resolution is much more uh, important and relevant and definitely will affect our uh, classification. So. Very often, the non-parametric uh, uh, methods are actually uh, connected with uh, uh, currently with different deep uh, uh, learning or machine learning uh, uh, methods. And um, uh, in one of the examples, for example, even here in these simulations that we used, we uh, use the galaxy vector support. Uh, uh, the support vector uh, machine learning uh, method uh, algorithms in order to do all the, the simulations and also to uh, classify morphologically galaxies uh, in uh, different surveys such as uh, Lambda and uh, SXDS. So I think uh, uh, the next part is uh, related uh, uh, with the main uh, relations in galaxies. But uh, taking into account the lecture uh, from that we had a lecture uh, tomorrow as well, then uh, uh, we can uh, stop here and uh, we can leave the last uh, 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 15 minutes, I think, for, for questions. And then uh, we can go through the uh, scaling relations uh, tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, lecture. I have to say that I learned a lot myself. Uh, I didn't realize uh, all of this uh, detailed complexity and variation uh, in the studies of galaxies. Uh, this has been quite, uh, quite, uh, quite informative. Thank you very much. Um, so there are some, a few questions uh, on the chat. I will just go back to the beginning. Okay, earlier somebody asked, uh, is there a distinction or a distinct line difference between astrophysics and astronomy. Okay, so um, uh, in principle, um, uh, it, it is more currently we don't really make uh, important uh, difference between astronomy and astrophysics. In the past, we actually in the past when we really uh, were lacking more observational data. Uh, um, astronomy was more focused on, let's say, studying the mathematical properties of, of the celestial sources, so their position, uh, um, also physics, different physical properties, but we didn't have uh, uh, the instrumentation advanced so much that we can really enter uh, deeply into the physics of the celestial uh, sources. So basically nowadays, then when we started to uh, study more uh, physics as our uh, photometric, spectroscopic, polarimetric uh, observations uh, improved, 
uh, we were really able to study more uh, the physics of sources, the chemistry, even though to, uh, like, as I mentioned, to study the chemical properties uh, and so on, you know. Um, so basically, we don't really nowadays uh, have a very, very uh, clear difference between astronomy and uh, astrophysics. Astronomy, however, still is, uh, I would say, much broader concept um, than uh, the astrophysics, no? But um, uh, basically, it's more uh, for historical, uh, historical reasons and then how the astronomy was developing that we are still sometimes calling it astronomy, sometimes astrophysics, sometimes we will have department of astronomy and astrophysics, so it's, it's a bit, uh, it can be confusing, but there is no really nowadays a big difference. Okay, uh, Kola raised her, uh, his hand. Kula, you can also ask your question that you have on the chat. Please go ahead. Yeah, I just raised my hand because like uh, the first question was kind of already answered. So, uh, so I, I, want, I wanted to find out, um, since you said at the beginning of the talk that um, you can't really conduct experiments in astrophysics because the stuff that you're working with is very far and it's very large. How do you, how do you then uh, validate validates your the methods that you use like the, the emission line spectra that you you use to uh, um to 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 determine the properties of different galaxies if you're not able to you, you know um handle the galaxies if that's the correct word yeah um, so uh, these are exactly the the data that i mentioned uh, the uh, and the data products, uh, the images that we are getting uh, from photometric observations and then the spectra that we are getting from uh, spectroscopic observations uh, are really our, our proofs. I mean, uh, um, uh, these are really the, uh, the direct, uh, um, um, let's say, uh, evidences no, on, or, or about what is really going on uh, uh, inside uh, the galaxies and so far away from us. The problem is then uh, how do you interpret uh, all the information and uh, and the knowledge you know that uh, we managed uh, to really extend uh, amazingly over the past uh, decade. So using the spectra, as I said, I mean uh, all the, the the methods in terms of analyzing uh, spectra, but also images in terms, one important thing that I didn't mention uh, when I mentioned the data is the data reduction. I mean, people who are doing astronomy uh, uh, know that um, uh, once you get your observations, uh, either images or spectra, you cannot, so first to observe your sources is one part of, of the, the job in our science. But then once we get the data from our telescopes and instruments, we cannot use this data directly for doing uh, analysis and science. First, we have to do the data reduction because the data that we get are a mixture between the signal coming from, uh, from celestial sources, so stars and galaxies, and then the noise. The noise that is coming uh, from the instrument, the noise that is coming from uh, our atmosphere, the noise that can come from uh, side effects like cosmic rays uh, and uh, background and so on, you know. So uh, all of these, uh, first we have to uh, reduce the data, which means to eliminate all the noise or to minimize all the noise that is coming, that is not coming from our celestial sources. And once we have our data reduced, we can actually start with doing uh, science and uh, analyzing the data. So. Uh, regarding the, the spectra in particular that you mentioned, uh, um, uh, nowadays after so many decades of uh, analyzing spectra, we managed, uh, it's, it's like a puzzle. So you, you start from, from basically nothing and then uh, with all further uh, works, uh, your knowledge will be extending. So uh, regarding spectra of, uh, of um, uh, stars and galaxies, we already know uh, because basically every single emission and absorption line uh, will be related with a certain chemical element. So a lot of uh, it that we use in astrophysics for chemical for studying the chemical composition 
uh, in uh, stars or galaxies, we actually um, use the knowledge coming from atomic physics, from nuclear physics, mm. uh, atomic physics, from nuclear physics, and then also from our labs. So basically, we know that in nature, every single atom uh, and molecule is uh, unique. And we know that when we obtain the spectra of um, emission and absorption with emission absorption lines, uh, that every single uh, line uh, is related with a certain wavelength. And uh, when I have uh, the certain, uh, the, the line detected at a certain uh, wavelength, I can know exactly uh, to which chemical element that line uh, corresponds. Because uh, the lines that we are observing will be related with the, um, with the photons that are emitted due to the um, uh, change of the electrons bet uh, within the en energetic levels. And we know from atomic physics that uh, each energy level in each atom has a unique uh, value and that that energy level uh, energy of uh, particular um, difference between two energy levels is related with uh, um, uh, the, the frequency or the wavelength. Mm -hmm. So basically, by studying uh, the spectra of stars and galaxies, as I said, we are using also uh, as a reference uh, the, the information that we have from our physics labs uh, from all the, the nuclear uh, physics. However, in astrophysics, we do extend that uh, knowledge, especially when you come to the field of molecules, uh, for example, where, uh, where we still have to improve our uh, knowledge and our methods of detection. So when you go to the uh, uh, part of uh, the molecular astrophysics, uh, we can in universe uh, detect many of the exotic molecules uh, that uh, we we don't really know about them even here on the on the earth and that can really contribute to to our um, our knowledge not only in astrophysics but uh, but in general so i don't know if that uh, make uh, more clear your question yeah i think the, when you when you mentioned how you use um, the, um nuclear physics and and, and other fi other fields um to 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 determine the properties of of of, of extra galactic galaxies then yeah that, that that really made sense to me and then uh it's one more question it's related to the galactic rotation rotation curves um, mm -hmm. how, 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 does, how does your measurement of uh, properties of galaxies, how is it, how is it um, uh, affected by the presence of dark matter? Because I know that like, you, you get phenomena um, with the presence of dark matter in, in the universe where you have, you, you have a, what you call galactic lens, um, gravitational lensing, um, where photons, photons emitted from a certain source are, are, are deflected by a large um, source of dark matter, and and then you, you get you get what you call um, Einstein rings. Mm -hmm. So you get, how how does that affect your measurement of uh, different of different uh, of properties of galaxies? And if you do find like Einstein rings in the universe, then do you, are you able to reconstruct the, the the shape of those galaxies or like luminous um, um, mm -hmm. masses? So um, uh, it's again uh, quite a broad uh, topic, but I will try to, to summarize uh, taking into account the time. And I think uh, there are also, I can see in chat uh, like 14 uh, messages. So, um, so basically um, um, what, is, uh, what I mentioned uh, regarding the spiral galaxies is their importance uh, in order to uh, study the rotational curves and then to measure the amounts and the distribution also of the dark matter. So that was one of the uh, the first uh, ways how we actually detected uh, the, the presence of dark matter that we still don't know what it really is. But uh, through the rotational curves of uh, spiral galaxies, we first saw that there is additional amount of mass that is, let's say, missing that is not baryonic, that we are not able to really detect through our uh, uh, observations. So uh, the amount of uh, dark matter will definitely uh, affect directly uh, the, the measurement of our mass. So when we speak actually about the mass of the galaxies, 
uh, we uh, refer to two types. Uh, um, uh, we have the total mass of the galaxy, and then what we call the stellar mass of the galaxy, and then you can also say the uh, amount of the dark matter in the galaxy. You know? So these are, or the mass of the dark matter in the galaxy. So these are uh, a bit of the free concept that we are dealing with when we are speaking about the mass of the spiral galaxies, you know? or, 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 or galaxies in general. So basically, uh, uh, the total mass of the galaxy would be the baryonic uh, uh, mass plus the dark matter uh, mass. But to measure the total mass of the galaxy is not a trivial issue because we have to first measure what the dark uh, matter uh, mass is, which again is not a trivial issue at all. And we still have a lot to do in order to improve our methods. No? So what we normally, when we normally speak about uh, uh, mass of the galaxy, uh, we normally uh, refer to the stellar mass, which is something that, or the baryonic uh, mass, that we can measure uh, very easily. And we do have developed uh, methods, uh, both through the spectroscopic observation, uh, observations and then photometric observations as well. When you go to the larger scales, uh, so when you go from individual galaxies to now uh, clusters of galaxies where you can observe uh, the gravitational lensing, uh, uh, where you will have the source, uh, the, the distant source, uh, source that is far away uh, uh, from us uh, emitting light, but then having another source or cluster of galaxies or system of galaxies in front, in the way between us and uh, the source that is emitting light. As you said, that uh, cluster of galaxies or another massive galaxy can uh, be used uh, as a deflector. And using the gravitational lensing that I will mention uh, tomorrow, uh, it is true you can measure. So on one side, you will have the gravitational lensing will be depending the strength of the, the, the lensing, but also the shape of the lensing, because not always you, you can, you, you will have instant uh, ring. Sometimes you can just see the arcs. So the shape of the arcs, the distribution of the arcs, the, the strength of the arcs and so on will depend on many properties on the uh, light of the source that is emitting, uh, the distance of the source, the position of the source that is emitting depending on the deflector, but also the properties of the deflector. So you will measure for the deflector very easily what is the baryonic mass, but mm -hmm. then from the strength of the gravitational lensing, you can uh, measure what should be the total mass that the deflector has and the dis distribution of that total mass. So knowing the baryonic part uh, and knowing the, from the gravitational lensing, as I said, the, the total mass and the distribution, you can then uh, uh, obtain the information about the amount of dark matter that you have within the system uh, or the so massive source and then the distribution of the dark matter. But it's a very painful work. I mean, it sounds easy, but actually it is not. And what we do is uh, we use numerical simulations. So because you are dealing with, as I said, so many parameters that are into the play that depend on both the deflect deflector, but also the source that is emitting light. So uh, uh, do, dealing with so many uh, source uh, parameters, you really need to deal with numerical simulations in order to finally see what the best fits uh, your, your observational data. Um, so, um, Miriana, you, I think you had some other engagement or do you, you want to take another question? Or should we leave the question for the rest for yes. tomorrow? Uh, Exactly. So maybe maybe another five minutes, uh, right. and then the other uh, questions we can maybe uh, leave for for tomorrow. Okay. So if there is any question that is so, more focused yeah. on um, the content from uh, from today, and then uh, uh, if the others are focused, I'm saying because tomorrow, since we will continue with the scaling relations, AGN, and so on. Um, um. All right, so I think well, who are the astrophysicists uh, in the audience uh, um, who want to, um, all right, so Abdella, are you, Meiki, are you there? Can you talk, uh, are you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Please I go ahead. Go. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the lecture. It's really um, informative and I learned a lot actually myself. If you can please um, tell us um, briefly about the Pulit, Pulit galaxy. 
I hear about it, but, and I I, uh, I don't know. I don't know much about it. Is it like a, uh, is what? it like a, the bullet bullet galaxy? A bullet clusters. Uh, the, yeah, the bullet cluster or bullet galaxy. Um, do you hear me? So, yes, yes, I do hear you. But I think maybe it's better if we, will you be tomorrow uh, on the lecture as well? Because tomorrow yeah, yeah. we will go through the, so tomorrow we will go through the uh, groups and the clusters. So maybe it okay. will be easier if I, if I uh, come to the question uh, tomorrow. Okay, and one I'm, more I'm question saying if just possible. Because of, uh, because of other, other questions. Okay, um, sure. Oh, maybe yes. Mijana, you can pick the question you want to answer now yeah. from the chat. Yes, I'm trying. Uh, okay, so for example, there is one question, what the different colors of the galaxies indicate about their properties? I think it's, I think it's the same person from- Yeah, that was answered, uh, essentially, yes. Okay, uh, wait. Um, so Meiki, so we come back to your question tomorrow, okay? Yeah, okay, sure, no problem. Another yeah. one is uh, the, okay, the last one uh, is more related with today. Uh, what is a dust uh, disk and how does, uh, does it help you to learn the properties of a galaxy? Okay, so, uh, uh, so the, the, the disk, I hope it uh, stayed clear what we mean by the disk of the galaxy. Uh, no, I don't know if, uh, Salai, do you want to connect? Hello? So, uh, hello? Yeah. Hello. Okay, hello. hello. So is it, is it clear what, uh, was it clear what, the, what do we mean by the disk of the galaxy? Um, can I explain? Um, it's my eight-year-old daughter that wants to know. <laughs> Your eight-year-old daughter. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> because she <laughs> she's interested she what she's interested in astronomy so she's listening to the lesson and she had that question sorry oh, okay okay great <laughs> that's nice okay that's great so i hope i hope it stayed clear what the galaxy disk is so basically in each galaxy we have uh, uh, many, many stars. Like in our Milky Way, we have between 200 to 400 uh, billions of stars. So the space between the stars is not empty. It is filled with the gas and dust that we call interstellar uh, medium uh, that I mentioned previously. So dust, dust particles uh, uh, are one of the components of this interstellar medium. So basically we have really like dust particles that have different chemical composition uh, made of um, uh, uh, silicates, of uh, graphites, uh, uh, water molecules as well. Uh, but these uh, dust uh, uh, particles are important in the galaxy, although they, are, they form a very small fraction of the total amount of the galaxy, they are important because they absorb the light. So, when you have this uh, dust in the disk, so for example, in the Milky Way, the Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. And we also do have the, the dust that is filling the space between the stars, like between our sun and other stars. So one of the, uh, one of the things why we don't see, because uh, our solar system in the Milky Way is not in the center of the Milky Way. We are located out of the center of the Milky Way Hello. <laughs> so the solar system uh, uh, is located out of the center of the Milky Way. So between the center of the Milky Way and the outskirts in one of these uh, spiral arms. So basically, the largest concentration of stars, billions and billions of stars, are concentrated in the central part of the galaxy, in what we call the bulge of our Milky Way. So basically, if there is no interstellar medium, if the space between the stars is empty, we would not be able to have night. When we look uh, toward the, the, the center of our galaxy, having billions of stars, all these stars will be shining so much that the night on the sky would not be possible, basically. And we would be able to observe directly to the center of our, uh, our galaxy. Why we don't see the center of our galaxy uh, even when we take the optical images, is exactly because of the presence of dust. 
So these dust particles are important because they absorb the light. So the light that is emitted by stars will come to the dust particles and they will be blocked. So the dust particles will become hotter, warmer, but they will um, uh, absorb the light coming from the, the stars. So then when you have, when you now assume all the amount of dust in one galaxy, that means that this uh, dust can change the proper, the parameters that we are measuring. So for example, if we measure, if we want to measure the total luminosity or the brightness of one galaxy, we have to also know what is the amount of dust so that we know how much of light will be absorbed by that dust and then to add that amount of uh, light to the luminosity that we measure. So that means that the galaxies, uh, spiral galaxies, uh, when we measure their brightness, if they have dust, it means that they are even brighter. Mm -hmm. So it can affect the measurement of, uh, of, uh, of our properties. So that's, that's why the dust, uh, it's important to know uh, the properties of the dust, the distribution of the dust, the amount of dust uh, as well. And uh, I said uh, 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 that the dust is related with the disk because the largest amount of dust we find in the galactic uh, disk. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, is that clear? <laughs> <laughs> Was that clear? Yes. Yes? Okay, good. Oh, Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> Silly. Okay. I'm glad. <laughs> Excellent. So, <laughs> she doesn't want to do physics, but she likes astronomy. She like astronomy. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Miriana, so maybe we can stop for now and, and allow you to uh, attend to your other engagement, and then uh, we continue tomorrow. Uh, so, for the people who are connected, tomorrow's lecture. Yeah. It's going to start earlier. It will be at 13 uh, universal time. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, yeah. uh, just uh, just uh, one question um, uh, to have a bit, because for me, it was really not uh, easy uh, to, to see a bit uh, what the level of the lecture should be, uh, depending on the diversity of the, the people, uh, the background. Uh, so for tomorrow, shall I uh, stick to the same level or uh, shall it be more advanced or shall it be less uh, uh, advanced? Uh, so what do you suggest? Uh, I, I think let's stay with the same, the same level. I think there are a few people here who are very advanced, uh, like the, uh, the journey and so forth. And there were some other people who couldn't, who are also advanced, but couldn't make it because they have lectures at the at the school and stuff like that. Uh, but I think the level, the way we have it now is, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's actually fine for the people who are connected. Uh, okay. Anybody object or if any of the participants um, want the, something more strong or? Yeah, Kitivi, I mean, it, it wouldn't harm if we, if, we, if, we, if we learn about a bit advanced uh, stuff. I mean, okay. Yeah. Fine. So, Miriana, so I just propose that I don't know. I I need to uh, a bit a bit advanced. Okay. Need to see other people' opinion. Yeah. Okay. All right. And so. also, we will we will try to prepare ourselves actually, and we will ask you like many many questions for tomorrow. Okay, that's, that's great. Good. All right. <laughs> Sounds very good then. So if if uh, you can keep the questions that we didn't manage to uh, reply today, you can keep them for. Yes, tomorrow. I will. I will save the yeah. chat. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, so a lot of people, a number of people say, so some people say it's, a level is okay, other people want a bit more advanced so you can have a mixture, yeah, just like to reflect the, the, the diverse level of participants. So, so you can see yeah, now so the reaction. It's, it's yeah, it's a bit, uh, yeah, it's, it's diverse, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, I will try to, to mix uh, okay. the two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very okay, good. good. Okay. Good. Yeah, thanks again very much. Uh, I hope we Thank didn't you. we didn't hold you up too, too for too long. That's so. uh, that's fine. Thank you very much as well and uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Then. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we meet tomorrow okay, then. Bye -bye. Okay. Bye bye everyone. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye, -bye. bye, -bye everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Thank you very much.
Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.